homes. They are not made for people who are five foot two. <laughs> so it's always good to try and escape the home, right? Because otherwise I am even shorter than I am. Um, it is fabulous to be part of this 40th anniversary of Women's and Gender Studies at um, Colorado. Uh, we spent this afternoon hearing the history of how Women's and Gender Studies got created here. And one of the things you should know, next time you walk by the cottage, right, or the next time you know, one of your friends is about to take a Women's and Gender Studies course, or you're already deciding to major in it or minor in it, you should realize that compared to other departments here on campus, this was a grassroots from the bottom up <coughs> creation. And you can't say that about many academic departments. The other thing that we all learned this afternoon, that it was created out of student activism as well as faculty pressure. So it's a really unusual academic program that comes from the grassroots, it comes from an alliance between the students and faculty, and also activists in the Boulder um, community as well. So it's a very special thing to have Women's and Gender Studies at uh, Colorado. The other thing is that um, this 40th anniversary makes it one of the oldest women's studies programs uh, in the United States. The oldest is, say it somebody, San Diego State. San Diego State had the very, very, very first, and they have their own political stories to tell. In fact, every place, if you've got friends that are going to university at other colleges and universities, Get them to tell you how their women's studies or women's and gender studies started there. There's a political story at every single campus, and they're not exactly the same. Although almost all of them were created bottom up. Almost no women's studies program at any university in the world, and now there's women's and gender studies. Well, one of the strongest is in South Korea. I have friends in Tokyo who have created very strong programs, but also in Chile and in Britain and Ireland and uh, many other countries in the world. Namibia has a women's studies program. So you're, you're at a very momentous occasion here. Um, and so when um, Lorraine and Emmanuel and Aditi and others of, I, uh, of us started talking online about what might be interesting to you all, we thought that perhaps this would be a time to really say, well, what happens if you use your gender analytical skills, your feminist curiosity, both, feminist curiosity, and I'll talk about that, but feminist curiosity and your gender analytical skills. And by gender analytical skills, I mean that you become smart about the workings of masculinities, plural, and femininities, plural, to make sense of things that other, other people don't think are gendered at all. So in this case, it's the war in Syria. Um, you probably saw, if you had a chance to look at the morning television programs or listen to NPR or looked at New York Times, you probably saw that the United States military, I mean, with uh, Obama's um, approval, of course, um, but without any action by Congress. Right? Um, when was the last time the U.S. Congress declared war as required by the U.S. Constitution? What was the last war? that the U.S. Congress actually took a recorded vote saying, yes, we approve this country going to war. When was the last one? World War II. World War II. So not the Korean War, not the Vietnam War, not the wars in Central America, not the first Gulf War, not the second Gulf War, not the Afghan War. None of those actually have been declared um, by Congress as required by the Constitution. What I've learned, and I'm not, a, I'm not an, Arab, an Arabic speaker, that's to my fault, I'm not a Middle Eastern specialist, but what I've learned as a feminist is always ask in any conflict or in any lead up to a conflict that maybe could be forestalled, always ask what are the workings of masculinities that is how people imagine manliness, how they set up competitive manlinesses amongst each other. Always ask that question. And always ask, 
how do women experience the lead up to the conflict, the conflict itself, and if they're lucky, the wind down of the, um, the armed conflict? Always ask those questions. Not because you know what the answer is, but because you will find out things about why that conflict has occurred and how it's happening and what it leaves in its wake, that is, what its consequences are, that you would never, otherwise never find out. The current war in Syria, and I realize a question and answer or your own stories, if you want to sort of figure out what are the differences between ISIS, the Syrian government, the Iraqi government, and where the U.S. government is playing its part in all of those, you know, if it's not clear in the talk, ask, okay? Because this war that the United States has now gotten involved in very directly by both direct military aid to a number of the rebels in Syria and by um, authorizing military bombardments of what they hope are ISIS targets, both in Iraq and in Syria, is being done in our name. And anything that's done in your name, you had better find out more about it, because people are claiming that you feel more secure as a result. So you better figure out whether you do feel more secure, whether you do think that this is rightfully done in your name. And then you can make up your own decision. So let's start with our feminist analysis of the Syrian civil war in 2011. We could start earlier, but I'm going to start there, and then I'm going to say why actually we need to think earlier. But 2011, and especially February and March 2011, is when some Syrians, but when I say some, I mean hundreds that grew to thousands, of Syrians who had become increasingly discontent with their government's authoritarian ways of carrying on public life. And this is the government headed by President Assad, A-S-S-A-D, if you're taking notes. Um, and President Assad um, had increasingly uh, put the screws on all sorts of efforts to build some kind of civil society in Syria. Because Syria has poets. Syria has a very lively community of filmmakers. <coughs> Syria has a very um, educated um, population. Syria has universities. Syria has museums. And out of all of this, people, in fact, increasingly began to say, we can make a better Syria. We can have a Syria that isn't so dominated by a particular party and its regime. <coughs> This is the Assad regime that's based in the party called the Ba'athist Party, B-A-A-T-H-I-S-T, uh, the Ba'athist Party. Um, and people began to call for more democracy in Syria. When you look at, and you can go back, and you can actually see photographs of those first public demonstrations in February and March 2011, so not so long ago, right? Look at the photographs. They don't tell you everything, but I always look at photographs because if you have a feminist curiosity, you count. You always count. And whenever the media put up a photograph of a demonstration and say, people demonstrating for, I always wonder, I wonder if they're people and whether they're all men. So if you go online and look at the big climate change march in New York City this weekend, one of the biggest demonstrations in the United States in the last generation. Go look at photographs and see if, in fact, it is mixed gender um, or not. If you, and we now know this not just from photographs, but if you look at those pro-democracy demonstrations in Damascus, that's the capital of Syria, in Homs, one of the major cities of Syria, you will notice and we know this from other documentation, that many women, as well as men, came out calling for Assad to agree to some modest democratic reforms, February, March, 2011. 
Assad and his closest advisors, particularly in the security forces, which is now a new term you will hear used internationally, and that usually means both police and military, right? And the relationship between police and military is not quite the same in every country. So security force uh, commanders and Assad decided that, that those demonstrators calling for some modest democratic openings in the life of Syrians was too threatening to their, their regime. And so what they did is they responded to those demonstrations with violence. That is, the armed uh, security forces and the military came out and engaged in arrests, and they engaged in actual violence against uh, the demonstrators. At that point, I have to think what it would be like, right? You're a teacher, you're a hospital administrator, you work for a film crew, maybe you're even a civil servant. Now what do you do? Now what do you do? And amongst Syrians, of course, there's a lot of confusion, a lot of disheartening response to think that they couldn't even have this level of demonstration without a violent response. And many of the people who experienced that decided that they had to, if you will, fight fire with fire. That is, that they would now withdraw from peaceful, these were all nonviolent demonstrations, they would withdraw from nonviolent action and actually meet the Assad security forces with militias of their own. Now, it's very hard to get armaments in any autocratic regime. It's very hard to get any kind of even modest weaponry um, if you have a tightly held um, militarized regime the way the Assad regime is. But some weapons were found and some were taken by um, con conscripts in the military. Assad has a, uh, a male conscription, just like the US draft up until 1973, um, the Assad regime still has a uh, conscription for men. And so some men took their guns as conscripts, left the army, and joined rebel militias. Now, at this point, and this is why you're going to keep your gender legs on, at this point you get a transformation of the pro-democracy movement in Assad. It becomes increasingly masculinized because many women felt that they could not or, was, or were opposed to the use of violence against violence. Of course, a lot of Syrian men were also opposed, but were more persuaded to join the rebel militias. So what started out as a mixed men and women's pro-democracy movement in March 2011, by the time we got to early 2012, the militias were overwhelmingly male, that is the rebel militias. The security forces of Assad himself were totally masculinized. What's the percentage of women in the U.S. military today? Do you know? The U.S. active duty. U.S. I'm not talking about reserves um, or uh, national guard. Just active duty U.S. military. Do you know what percentage the U.S. military is out of the 20 to 30? It's 14 percent. Only 14. Uh, and that's 14% after 30 years of pushing for a more mixed gender military. But the Assad regime still had male conscripts. So it, the United States Congress and Defense Department started re deliberately recruiting women into the US military, not because of the women's movement, but because they lost access to all of you who could be conscripted as young men. When the US Congress, at the end of the Vietnam War, ended male conscription in the United States, the Congress plus the Defense Department put their heads, which were mainly male heads, together and began to think, well, how are we going to keep up such a big military? They could have made the choice to cut back the military. But they decided, no, no, that wasn't possible. They'd keep up as large a military as they had when they had the draft, 
and therefore they'd have to bring more women in to fill the spaces, particularly of middle class men who now had more economic opportunity and weren't going to join the military unless they were conscripted. So, because Assad has male conscription, always ask gender questions about every country's military. Every country's military. Because Assad has <coughs> male conscription, he had an almost virtually all male security force, both the police and the army. But what was beginning to happen now was the pro democracy civil society movement was, in fact, also becoming masculinized as it began to move from nonviolent action to increasingly militarized action in the form of very fragmented militias. The militias are not under any unified command. That's by about 2012, 2013. Now, let me jump to, because this is in my own learning process. Last January, I was asked to come to Geneva, Switzerland, um, to take part really as a kind of fly on the wall, not because of expertise at all, to really be a observer, semi-participant, but mainly observer, to an effort by transnational feminist peace organizations, and I'll tell you more about them in a minute, to try and get women civil society activists from Syria, Syrian women, at the peace negotiations table. Now, you probably hear, if you take courses or you read the paper, you hear about peace negotiations, or you hear about peace talks, whether they be in the Congo or Rwanda or Cambodia or Yugoslavia or Colombia. You hear about peace negotiations. In fact, very crucial peace negotiations are going on right now uh, for Colombia. Well, I, I mean, you think I would think these things, but you know, I didn't really think about asking feminist questions about peace negotiations. They seemed quite technical. Um, they seemed pretty removed. I never knew the names of anybody sitting around the tables at these various negotiations. But when I was invited to Geneva, I was invited to actually be there to watch an effort by international feminist peace groups to get women at the Syrian peace talks. So you got to imagine the table, right? Because there really is the table, right? The classic and still conventional wisdom is that the men who have guns are the only ones who can make peace. Think about that that the men who wield the weaponry of violent power are the only ones who are capable of making peace in a country or a region. And that is still, that's the United Nations Convention. I want to small to see, that's the way of doing things. That's the United States presumption government at the government level. It's the Russian presumption, it's the British presumption. It's almost everybody's presumption that the only people you need to have at the peace table are, in fact, the warring parties. Now, who does that leave out? Well, it leaves out most women, because in almost all civil wars, no matter what the sides are disagreeing on, if once you've gotten to the point that you're really at a full-fledged civil war, you mainly have masculinized forces facing masculinized forces even if you as outside observers or members of the country weigh in one way or the other as to which you hope will win, it is an increasingly masculinized conflict. But what I learned in Geneva last January was that doesn't mean that women have disappeared. That doesn't mean that no women are being political in the middle of the war. That is, in the middle of war is gender politics. Wartime doesn't end the debates, both within families, within communities, within political parties, about what should be the stands on domestic violence. So for instance, within most wars, domestic violence goes up. Think about that. Within most <coughs> war zones, domestic violence, within families, within households, goes up. So domestic violence 
and civil war are not separate. They, in fact, feed each other. What we discovered was that Syrian women, while they now went underground because they didn't join most of the rebel militias, that Syrian women continued to organize after 2012. Syrian, a group of a dozen Syrian women came from Syria to Switzerland to both pressure the UN and the United States and Russia and Britain. The United States, Russia, Russia and Britain were the three governments that quote unquote sponsored the, the Syrian peace talks in Geneva last January with the United Nations. And these women came from Syria to Geneva to say the following. One, women haven't disappeared. If you looked around the peace negotiation table, you'd think, my God, this has become a country of just men, or a country of just men with access to arms. But in fact, we Syrian women, we have continued to do the following. We've organized community by community, neighborhood by neighborhood, in order to get access to food, in order to give some kind of informal schooling for children in the middle of war, in order to provide some kind of health uh, clinics in war zones. Those things don't stop just because most media begin to cover it like an NFL football game. Right? Which is the favorite media story, right? The favorite media story is there is one team and there's another team and they've taken this town and they've taken that town and they have an air force and they don't have an air force. You know, Paul Wars knows the air game, right? I mean, that, that, that is not actually what happens in wars. So one of the things you learn when you ask feminist questions is that wartime is a time of continuing politics, grassroots politics, community by community politics. And these, these women who came from Syria had actually started forming coalitions. Now you have to think of how hard it is to travel from Aleppo to Homs, Homs to Damascus, and create anything called a coalition. But they had. They formed the Coalition of Women for Peace, the Syrian Forum for Peace. I mean, it's a miracle. I mean, if you think it's hard to organize on the CU campus, right? Just think what it's like when, in fact, you are threatened by um, authoritarian security forces, you are trying to take care of your family and your friends who don't have access to water or electricity or food, and then you try to organize, but they had. Now, to get to Geneva, these 12 women had to go through checkpoints. How many of you have ever had to go through a checkpoint? I bet you, Lorraine, you've gone through a checkpoint. Where have you gone through a checkpoint? Well, just the um, U.S. <coughs> yeah, right. And what was it like when you went through? So you went through the border patrol, the border yeah. control, and we searched? Uh, I believe like we searched, yeah. Yeah, right. Were you searched physically or just your car? Just the car. Just the car, right. Anyone else been through? <coughs> yeah. What, what was it like? Where? Uh, Berlin, east to west. Uh huh. <laughs> yes, right. And what was that like? It was terrifying for me as a kid. I had no idea whether we were going to get through. Were you with your parents? Yeah. Yeah, right. And what was, what was the actual physical experience of the checkpoint the, at the wall? Yeah. Um, physical experience. We weren't patted down or anything. It wasn't a physical search like that, but it was you know showing your papers. And were you trustworthy? Yeah, you know, were you trustworthy? Did you have the right kind of documents? Were they actually going to respect the documents that we had to so that it was okay to go to East Berlin? Were we going to be allowed to go back? back. Uh, and everywhere there are the rights. Absolutely. Both sides. Right? Uh, yes. And and nobody is trustworthy. Right. I was headed down, actually more than down. I left actually in 1978 when oh. we had no freedom. So I was only... 1978? Yeah, I was 20 years old then. And I remember just to go through the classroom, they tried to take everything out of you and make sure you don't bring any secret documents, you don't bring any jewels, which they think belongs to the government. 
even if it's your family jewelries. So they took me to the room and they start like trying to take my clothes off. And I had male and female guards. There was a female guard, and I had that piece of jewelry underneath, just a cheap, cheap pearl, one pearl, and just pull it out. But the nervous system was so uh, sensitive at that time. Just to, it took a year just to make documents to get the gloves there as refugees. My friends disappeared at that time in college, and I was told if I keep looking for them, I'll disappear too. Really? Yes. Yeah, so it, it took it took quite a bit, and by the time that piece of jewelry wasn't worth it anyway. But then they, they end up taking me upstairs to the police because I broke the jewelry. And then at that time, my husband, who was my high school sweetheart, who got married, and he had relatives in Israel, so that's how we had a chance to get out. He followed me and told them that she's crazy. We don't want her to <laughs> by their sexist stereotypes, mm -hmm. their fear of the hysterical yes. woman, right? Actually, that's the same as a crazy woman. Yes, right. But checkpoints, this is something to really keep in mind. You know, we talk about international politics, and we talk about kind of the big confrontation of forces. But the daily life in a war zone is the life of checkpoints. And checkpoints are can be set up by almost anybody to die, deny access around a road. And you don't often know who it is that is staffing, I almost said manning, staffing that checkpoint. What you do know is that you won't be able to see your mother, or you won't be able to get to your job, or you won't be able to get medical care unless you go through that checkpoint. Now, checkpoints are very gendered. One, they are the place, more often than not, where women are sexually harassed at checkpoints. So now think of these Syrian women. First of all, they got out of the war zone by going through checkpoints. They had to get visas so they could get out of Syria and into Switzerland. Um, and what was astounding to me, I'll jump just a little bit, what was astounding to me is that after the week of discussion and negotiation and their failed attempts to get into the peace talks as representatives of civil society, they all went back. Just think about that. They all went back because they all felt that the work they were doing in the Syrian war zone was so crucial that they could not enjoy the freedom of staying in, in Switzerland. So they got out, they came to Geneva, and what they told us was that, so this is now, you have to think, this is what feminist analysis, feminist thinking, feminist, you call it even theorizing, this is what feminist analysis sounds like if you're an activist in a war zone. They said, look, doing medical clinics with whatever you've got. Creating informal schools so the children, because you know how long this war is going to last, so the children don't lose their opportunity to learn. Creating some kind of safety for women who no longer have male protection. Those things are not just humanitarian aid, they are building democracy. This is what democracy looks like. And they said, that's why those of us, men and women, but especially women, who are doing civil society work, community by community, oftentimes neighborhood by neighborhood, inside of war-torn Syria, that's why we have to be at the table. Because actually we are building democracy in the middle of war. If you're going to have any kind of resolution to these now highly violent conflicts, if you're going to have any kind of model for what the new Syria could be like. It has to be out of these sorts of skills, these sorts of organizations, and these kinds of experiences. And that's why we, 
they didn't mean just them by name. We have to be at the negotiations. The United Nations, the US government, the British government, and the Russian government, who are all the main organizers of the Syrian peace talks in Geneva in January 2014, said we don't think so. And so the Syrian peace talks fell apart because the men who were the main speakers and the main representatives of the peace talks, um, in fact, could not come to any kind of agreement. Okay, so now let's think about what's happened to the opposition to Assad. You have the Assad regime of Syria and its security forces, and the Assad regime has cultivated um, ties, especially with one um, sect of um, Syrian Islam called the Alawites. And the Alawites are the main, if you will, base of the Assad regime. On the other side, if you will, it's more complicated than that, but the people who are opposed to Assad have now fragmented terribly. They are no longer even as coherent, and they were barely coherent, as they were in January in Geneva. Because now what you've got is you've got those original pro-democracy activists, most of whom were, well, they were either Christian or Muslim, because Christians, there's quite a large Christian community in Syria um, who were supported by the Assad regime so long as they supported Assad. And they were, the Christians in Syria were told, only we can protect you from the rest of the Syrian population. So you will hear splits among Syrians as to whether they think Assad is their best hope or not. But the other, the major pro-democracy group was for a new secular state. Now Assad is secular, just like Saddam Hussein is secular, was secular. Okay. So keep in mind, a secular state doesn't mean a state that has no religious faith amongst its followers. A secular state is a state in which public authority does not privilege any particular um, faith. You really have to think hard about what a secular state is. But amongst the anti-Assad forces now are also pro-militant Islam opposition to Assad. They don't want a secular democratic state, they want an Islamist state. So they're opposed both to Assad and to the pro-democracy secularists that started the rebellion in the first place. And the most famous, well, the best known, uh, the most powerful of all of those, now they're Syrians, is the Nusra Front, the Nusra Front, um, which is an armed militia. Now in comes ISIS. You with me? You got me? You know, as they say in baseball, you can't tell the players without the program. But this matters. It matters that we not just kind of shake our heads and think, I can't follow this. Because, you know, what if you're British and you're trying to follow American politics? Really? <laughs> you know? So if we expect people, well, in Canada, to follow American politics, the least we can do is get our heads around what's going on in Syria. The ISIS militia, which now has all the headlines, because it is so clever about attracting our outrage. Those beheadings of the American journalists, and now probably the French journalists as well, those beheadings have been filmed and choreographed for our viewing. ISIS is very, very smart about how to grab our very short attention spans. They, those were done not for building Syrian strength, not for building Iraqi strength. Those were done to build military opposition against them in the United States so that we would do what we're now doing. Working, eh? All right. Most of the violence that the ISIS uh, militants have used have been against Iraqis, 
and against Syrians. But who are they? There are about 30,000, there's now a guess, there's about 30,000 armed ISIS um, uh, militants, that is, military personnel uh, fighting for ISIS. About 30,000 of them. The core of them are, okay, following now, the core of them are Iraqi Sunnis. Now, when did the United States go to war in Iraq? 2003. Good work. So for, two, for 11 years, we all should know the difference between Sunnis and Shias in Iraq. If we don't, or we don't think they matter, we should think about citizenship. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, you know, really, we all vote. We all choose senators and members of the House, and sometimes presidents and vice presidents, based on some notion of foreign <coughs> policy decision making. In Iraq, because ISIS is a continuation of the war in Iraq that is now spilled over to Syria. It's the continuation of what was started in 2003 in Iraq. In about 2007, the United States decided that the only, the United States government decided that the only way the United States was going to be able to withdraw its military from Iraq, that is, get out of the Iraq war. This was under George W. Bush, but then picked up by um, Barack Obama's government as well, was to create an Iraqi government that could look like kind of government. And what they did is they chose Maliki, who had spent most of his life um, as an underground opponent to Saddam Hussein in a very Shia-identified political party. So he was an underground guy. He wasn't an open democracy guy. He had learned all his political skills as an underground um, anti-Saddam Hussein activist. Underground, in a very particular political party, the Dawa party, that is very Shia identified. That's its electoral base. This is election politics. It's an it's electoral base. When Maliki was chosen by the United States to be the best hope as the new president of um, Iraq, what he did is he built his security forces, that's the police and the military, around men from the Shia community. This increasingly alienated the Sunni men of Iraq. And many of them had been in Saddam Hussein's army, and they had access to that weaponry that was never fully collected. So a lot of the ISIS men are, in fact, disaffected, Iraqi, Sunni-identified, Islamicist in their ideology, armed men. Their view of their goal is to create a, what they call a caliphate, a state that is from northern Iraq into southern Syria. And that's why they're operating in Syria as well. The women who seem to have any association with ISIS, ISIS is a highly masculinized movement and military. But it's interesting because, and we don't know enough here, but because these men seem to have a vision of themselves as not just anti-Maliki, not just anti-Baghdad, but also as proper Islamicist men, they believe they have to be married. So now, there is a deliberate recruiting effort, which is not without success, to try and get some women, especially from the Muslim communities in Northern England, most of whom are English Muslims, they're English-born young women, to come to Syria and Iraq and become the mates, the wives of ISIS men as performing their feminized religious duty. So 
always ask about marriage in the middle of war. Always ask about who's doing humanitarian aid and local community organizing in the middle of war. Always ask who's being invited to the official peace table and who do you notice is missing. Always ask who's at the peace table and what kind of peace do you think they will make. Ask feminist questions. It's great if you are a feminist, but at least ask feminist questions. Right? Make yourself more realistic about what a war is. Make yourself smarter, in fact, about what are the dynamics of war over time. Don't just treat it as an NFL game. Don't just treat it as a, an electronic game that you can play on your device. Treat it as a complicated, multifaceted, highly gendered, but fluid political process in which there is a lot of violence. And then see if, in fact, you can become even better as both local citizens, if you happen to be a US citizen, a US citizen, and especially see if it makes you a smarter citizen of the world. Thanks. Come from. And they tend to be young. The male recruits are anywhere from 16 to 25. 
in age. Um, and most, the highest percentage, comes from Tunisia. So what do you know about masculinity in Tunisia, folks? Right? What do you know about male unemployment in Tunisia? And that's how you figure out where groups are most likely to be enticed by this. But what a lot of their outrages have been aimed at is encouraging, and all they have to do is encourage five here, 10 there, 15 there. They're not, incur they're not trying to recruit a thousand at a time. And to try and use social media to portray ISIS as all powerful. And if you are a disaffected, unemployed person, right, especially male, and this is about masculinity, not about maleness, right, um, and you want to be on the winning side. You want to be on a side that is gaining ground. You want to be on a side that seems to be able to do anything they want with people in authority, who you've felt humiliated by most of your life. And that's the other choreographic um, <coughs> audience, I think. So what if they do it, um, and they've already, I mean, they've already heard it. So this is just, this is a particular kind of murder that can be shown graphically for the sake both of encouraging our militarization and encouraging recruitment of certain kinds of disaffected men in various countries. Of all the 30,000, I think it's estimated there are about 100 American men of the 30,000. I think from the UK, I think they think there are about a thousand men, maybe, maybe 500 to a thousand. So most of the recruits are not coming from Europe or from North America. But of course, that's the worry amongst the American intelligence services. Yeah, hi, D.D. Hi. I was just wondering if you could you know, just help me think a little bit about the feminist investment in peace in zones of conflict, right? Because I'm thinking of some of the contexts that I work in, um, in the context of Kashmir. You know, yes, right. Now that most state of India, that's a bone of contention between India and Pakistan. And, you know, there's a very vocal feminist emphasis on de-romanticizing peace. Absolutely. And, you know, very vocal feminist investment in act. So, you know, the women might not appear in the photographs, but they're there. Uh, cheering on very often, right? And I think as we've seen in the case of Palestine too, over time sometimes that popular support erodes, right? You know, militancy sort of gets tiring, people get caught in the crossfire, but it's, you know, it's by no means, a, you know, I'm just wondering what is the appropriate feminist question to ask in, in such a circumstance where you have, you know, a very vocal feminist support of armed rebellion especially in the context of occupations. Yes. I mean, this is, I mean, think of how many pro-women's rights um, women joined the <coughs> Russian Revolution, joined the Mexican Revolution, yeah. armed revolution, joined the Algerian Revolution, joined the Vietnamese Revolution. I mean, women supporting armed rebellion is not new, right? joined the American Revolution against the, the Britons. So what I think is a feminist question to ask amongst men is under what circumstances do which women find themselves choosing violent response to the oppression that they experience? And then be curious about it. I don't think that they're, for instance, these groups that brought the Syrian um, civil society activists to um, Geneva. Well, first of all, a lot of those civil society activists have tried very hard to stay out of the militias so they can be an alternative to building a new Syria. Because they see joining the militias as a dead end for the future of Syria. But that doesn't mean that they are pro-Assad. It doesn't mean they don't have ideas about the war that's being waged, but they're making a very strategic decision about how you build civil society for the sake of a country's future. 
but other women have been in Syria, um, have been providing health care to militiamen, have been smuggling in ammunition and or money to militiamen, and in any violent um, armed conflict, um, you will find women, as you say, not visible because they're not handling the weaponry, mm -hmm. but in fact are supportive of the, the militants. I mean, we just had a, a, have a whole new book out on women who supported the Confederacy military in the American Civil War. Right. Well, I, I think, but the question I'm asking is not just what do we make of women who support um, militancy, but you know, these are self-identified feminists, right, who, who sort of argue that this is the feminist thing to do. But I, I mean, the thing is, I, there's, there's been an ongoing, and it's a good ongoing, debate about, in fact, what is the best way to achieve justice, right? And not surprisingly, feminists don't always agree, as do non-feminists, right? And I think that's why I brought up the Chinese Revolution and the Algerian Revolution. A lot of the Algerian feminists joined the revolution against the French because they thought it was the only way to build a new Algeria. Of course, we can talk about Nicaragua, which you know, Rain knows most about. Um, because they actually thought this would create a more just, less patriarchal society. And they thought joining the armed rebellion would get their, if you will, foot in the door. And they would begin to actually work out some of these anti-patriarchal new kinds of family forms in the rebellion. Then the question is, what happens afterwards? Right? And that's why you can never turn off your feminist curiosity when the peace agreement has been signed. And the Algerian feminists will tell you what happened, this is, doesn't mean every place is Algeria, right? It doesn't mean every place is Nicaragua. But it does mean that those women who thought that winning the war, armed struggle, against the autocratic patriarchal regime would herald in a time of less patriarchy, of less sexism, of more gender justice, that in fact many of them found that once their armed comrades, the men who headed those rebellions, got into state power, they abandoned a lot of not just their promises, some of their practices in the insurgent um, territories where they had practiced new kinds of family forms, they practiced new kinds of marriages. And when they got into state power, a lot of them abandoned that. And that's why there's a wonderful organization called Women Living Under Muslim Law, which is go online. They're one of the best um, transnational feminist groups. And the women who founded Women Living Under Muslim Law were Algerian women who fought against the French in the armed struggle and then felt betrayed when their comrades got into power in the new independent Algerian state and started to pass really conservative new family codes. So it's, I think the debate is an unending debate, and it should be. And then you can watch the debate continue over time as to what is the relationship of patriarchy to militarism, What's the relationship between gender justice and violence? What's the relationship between armed struggle and the post-armed struggle state? And you just have to stay attentive all the time.
lines of men in that song. Just think how homophobia works amongst men, right? That's comparing different kinds of manliness. But also the gap is wide between that particular kind of masculinity and almost all kinds of femininity are also likely to be amongst the most militarized states. So, there is, and this comes from a very funny source, well, funny to be surprising. There, there is an organization that probably most of you, since you've come to this event, don't know and love, and that is the World Economic Forum. They're most famous for meeting in Davos, Switzerland, every year. It's where, you know, Bill Gates hangs out with the head of the European Bank, and, right, in a ski lodge. Right, just watch about, is it about January? Is it about January when Davos is held? Right, just watch Davos. And, but, you know, women's irritation happens all kinds of places. And so amongst women, very prominent, many in the financial world, they got really tired of, even in their, highly privileged circles of the kind of men's um, taking over of these sorts of elite settings. And so they insisted that there be at least some funding of some kind of gender world comparison project. You know, that's a little great. I don't know who would notice, right? But, but, for all of us, it has led to very, very interesting comparison of 136 countries in the world. What you do is you go online, you go to World Economic Forum, right, that's has all the money, and then this project that they wheedled out of the guys is called the Global Gender Gap, okay? And it compares the gender gaps in 136 countries. And they do it every year, and they're very rigorous, and they look at the gaps between men and women's access to health care, men and women's access to elected office, men and women's access to paid full-time work, men and women's access in, in each country to various forms of education. That's what they compare. It's called the global gender gap. So what they're comparing is not whether more women in the United States go to college than women in Syria, they compare within the United States, what's the gap between men and women in higher education? And in Syria, what's the gap? And then they compare the gaps, okay? So it's a comparison, country by country, of inequalities. Syria, before the war, ranked 133rd out of 136, and so of inequality. And not because Syria is poor, not because all the women in Syria are poor, but because the gap between men and women in Syria was so high. So for instance, here's one of the gaps. Of all the people, this is before the war, right? So you could collect this kind of data with some understanding that it was unquote, a normal society. But before 2011, of all the people who had paid <coughs> full-time jobs, now that's the way to actually ask the question, paid full-time jobs, 85% of all the Syrians who had paid full-time jobs were men. Only 15% of all the people who had paid full-time jobs were women. Okay? In the United <coughs> States today, that gap isn't very great because America, amongst Americans, women are now 48% of all the Americans who have paid full-time work, okay? But, so, you're not, so Syria, 133rd, okay? Now mind you, that's the country that goes into war. That is, the condition between women and men before the war is gonna shape what happens to women and men during the war. So never start your analysis of women's relationships to men in war when the war breaks out. At least go back a decade and see what the conditions were. For instance, in Syria, in 2010, do judges see domestic violence as a crime or not? <laughs> 
So Syria is 133rd. What do you think the United States is in terms of gender gaps in health, all combined, health, education, politics, and economics? What do they do on Jeopardy? <laughs> the United States ranks 23rd. So the next time you hear the cheers at the Olympics, USA number one. Try USA 23rd. <laughs> okay. Now just take one indicator. That is, where does the United States rank in terms of the gap between women and men in the elected national legislature? Well, what is what? What's percentage of U.S. Congress today is women? Seventeen percent, which means that eighty-three percent are men. Always do the both. Don't just do the seventeen percent. Say who the eighty-three is, right? The United States, in terms of legislative gaps between men and women, now ranks in the world. Beat that drum. Seventy-six. Who ranks the tops in the world? You know? Rwanda. Rwanda is the only country in the world, and it's an elected, freely elected um, legislature. Rwanda is the only country in the world that has a higher percentage of women than men in its Congress, right, in its legislature. So, thinking about the gaps, the country with the least gap, doesn't mean there's no gap, with the least gap in all those four areas is, think of the two countries in the world that do, that voted not to have a military, and it's going to be one of those. Which countries don't have, decided, popularly decided, we don't need a military to be an effective political community? Which countries? Costa Rica. Somebody said Costa Rica. Costa Rica. And the second? Think North. Iceland. Iceland. And it's not, you know, it's, it's not, you have to investigate more, but it is not just happenstance that Iceland is one of the least militarized countries in the world, and it's a country with one of the smallest gaps between women and men's influence and access to resources. You've been very good. I'm going to let you go. <laughs>